Hi and welcome back. Today for a change we will see some osteology. The bone we have here is the temporal bone, one of the trickiest bones in head and neck. As far as temporal bone is concerned or for that matter any bone, the first thing to do when the bone is in hand is to identify the site and place it in correct anatomical position. Here for this bone that is the temporal bone the site can be identified with the help of certain features. Here the process here projecting is called zygomatic process. This zygomatic process is on the lateral side of the bone and is directed forwards. This pyramid shaped part that is the petrous part of temporal bone is directed medially and slightly forwards. This flat part that is the squamous part is directed upwards and the projection here that is the mastoid process and another needle like projection which is supposed to be here that is the styloid process. Actually I couldn't get hold of uh, temporal bone with styloid process. Uh, the styloid process of this particular bone is broken. Anyways, this is the location of the styloid process and the styloid process and the mastoid process both project downwards. Based on this, uh, you can make out that the bone I am holding here is the left temporal bone. Now coming to the parts of the temporal bone, the temporal bone has a squamous part that is here. The petrous part which is this one, the mastoid part with the mastoid process of course, the triangular piece of bone here is the tympanic part or the tympanic plate and uh, finally of course the styloid process. Now we will see each part in a little bit more detail. First let us deal with the squamous part. The squamous part contributes to the lateral wall of the skull part of the base of the skull and also part of the floor of the middle cranial fossa. As you can see here, it has an external or temporal surface and internal or cerebral surface. Zygomatic process as we saw already arises from its external aspect. This zygomatic process joins the temporal process of the zygomatic bone to form the zygomatic arch otherwise called zygoma. Inferiorly here, in the squamous part, you can see a depression that is the mandibular fossa which provides the space for articulation with the head of the mandible. Coming to some additional features in this lateral aspect, here we can see the temporal line which continues the supramastoid crest. Here we can also make out the anterior and posterior roots of the zygomatic arch. Here, this projection here is called the tubercle of zygoma, and the one here is the post glenoid tubercle. This triangle, which is formed by the supramastoid crest, the border of external acoustic meatus, and an imaginary tangent from the margin of external acoustic meatus to the supramastoid crest. This triangular area is referred to as supramiatal triangle. The inferior part as we already saw presents the mandibular fossa and the projection here is called the articular tubercle. The eminence, the eminence here is called articular tubercle. The cerebral surface of the squamous part forms the lateral portion of the floor and lateral wall of the middle cranial fossa. Here as you can see it presents with grooves for middle meningeal vessels and it is also kind of rough due to the impressions produced by sulci and gyri. Coming to the mastoid part it lies behind the opening here that is called external acoustic meatus. It presents a large downward projection called mastoid process as we already saw. Medial to the mastoid process there is a deep mastoid notch. Near the anterior end of the notch there is the stylomastoid foramen. Medial to the notch 
there is a groove here which is the groove for occipital artery posteriorly the mastoid part meets with the occipital bone at the occipitomastoid suture the mastoid foramen may be present on or near this suture the internal surface of the mastoid part forms part of the posterior cranial fossa it is marked by a groove for sigmoid sinus and by the internal opening of the mastoid foramen the mastoid foramen opens into the sigmoid sinus within its substance the mastoid temporal bone contains several air filled spaces called mastoid air cells the largest of these is called mastoid antrum which is closely related to the middle ear coming to the petrous part in an articulated skull this petrous part lies between the sphenoid bone anteriorly and occipital bone posteriorly it is pyramidal in shape with a base and apex and an anterior posterior and inferior surface it is directed medially and slightly forwards as we saw the apex of the petrous part lies in the angle between the basilar part of occipital bone and greater wing of sphenoid it forms the posterior margin of the foramen lazarum the anterior surface forms the part of middle cranial fossa there are a few features here a depression here called trigeminal impression which lodges the trigeminal ganglion a hiatus here called hiatus for greater petrosal nerve and another one here called hiatus for lesser petrosal nerve the hiatus for greater petrosal nerve is directed towards the foramen lazarum and the hiatus for lesser petrosal nerve is directed towards the foramen ovae that is an easier way to identify these apart from this the anterior surface of the petrous part of temporal bone presents an eminence here called arcuate eminence which is formed by the superior semicircular canal and this flat piece of bone here is called tegmen tympani the posterior surface of the petrous part forms part of the posterior cranial fossa it presents with an opening called internal acoustic meatus Posterolateral to this opening, there is a slit in the bone which is called aqueduct of vestibule. The anterior and posterior surfaces are separated by a sharp superior border which has a groove which lodges the superior petrosal sinus. The inferior surface presents the lower opening of carotid canal. The canal passes through the petrous temporal bone and opens into foramen lazarum. That's why you cannot see the opening of carotid canal in the cranial fossa. And here behind the opening of carotid canal is the jugular fossa. A triangular piece of bone which lies between the mandibular fossa and the external acoustic meatus is the tympanic plate and it forms the anterior, inferior and lower part of the posterior wall of external acoustic meatus. The lateral margin of the plate is a rough which gives attachment to cartilaginous part of meatus. The styloid process is normally present here but as I told you in this particular specimen it is broken. When it is present it is thin and pointed and it is directed downwards and forwards. Its base is ensheathed by the tympanic plate. The stylomastoid foramen is adjacent to the base of the styloid process. Coming to the articulations made by the temporal bone, as we already saw, the articular tubercle and mandibular fossa articulate with the head of the mandible to form the temporomandibular joint. The zygomatic process articulates with the temporal process of zygomatic bone to complete the zygomatic arch. Anteriorly, the squamous and petrous parts articulate with greater wing of sphenoid. Posteriorly, the petrous and mastoid parts articulate with the occipital bone. Superiorly, the squamous part articulates with the corresponding parietal bone. Before winding up, I will just give a glimpse of uh, the important muscle attachments as far as this bone is concerned and the structures passing through the important foramens in this bone. The lateral surface of the mastoid process gives attachment to three muscles, sternocleidomastoid, splenius capitis and longismus capitis, SSL. In short, the notch deep to the mastoid process gives origin to the posterior belly of the gastric. 
the styloid process which we are missing here gives attachment to five structures three muscles and two ligaments the muscles are stylohyoid styloglossus and stylopharyngeus and ligaments are stylohyoid ligament and stylomandibular ligament the mastoid foramen transmits an emissary vein connecting the sigmoid sinus with posterior auricular vein and also a meningeal branch of occipital artery the stylomastoid foramen transmits the facial nerve and the stylomastoid branch of posterior auricular artery the internal acoustic meatus transmits the seventh eighth cranial nerves and the labyrinthine vessels and of course the carotid canal transmits the internal carotid artery and venous and sympathetic plexus around the artery with this i think we have covered most of the essential features of temporal bone i hope you find the class useful until we meet in another class thanks for watching bye